All right, I think that's recording. I see the red dot up there. And welcome everyone. Uh, really glad that you're here. You're having a fantastic event. We are at the tail end, for those of you that are live, tail end of what is a just a great day. Great day to to block to think blockchain to to put the technical hat on. And what we wanted to do is launch you as you move into your hackathon with the use case mentality. And that's really putting your user first, thinking about all the network, thinking about the value that you're going to drive and building your first storyboard. This will serve as an accelerator, of course, when you want to give your pitch and will keep you centered while you're going through and going, do we want this feature? Do we, do we not want this feature? So use that. Always come back to you. what would your user want? What do your participants want? That will help you use center. Myself, I'm Kurt Wedgwood here from IBM and pleased to, to be here with Emily as well. I've been in the blockchain space at IBM for four years, helping clients develop their own solutions with the tools that we're going to be using today. So it's one where I've been in your shoes, I've competed, I have judged, and I look forward to, uh, to mentoring and seeing what world-changing uh, opportunities you bring here. So I can't, I can't be more excited than to, to be here with somebody who has a much finer accent than myself, <laughs> Emily, please. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. So I'm all the way on the other side of the world. I'm from Melbourne. Um, it is a Saturday morning here, so um, a little bit ahead of um, ahead of America over here. But um, yeah, so I'm a global design lead with IBM um, Blockchain Services. Um, I've been in the blockchain practice for about how long has it been now? Three years, three or four years, um, specializing in design for blockchain. So we look both at the UX design and we also look at more the business or strategic design. Um, so like Kurt was saying, today we'll be helping you through how to empathize with your users and create business cases that um, help real people. So hopefully this will set you all up really well for a great hackathon. Yeah. Okay, so let me know if anyone has trouble accessing that still. I think the way Mural set up for us is you have to actually create an account to be able to edit things. Um, but I can see like a few people have joined, which is great. Um, yeah, and while we're talking, while we're introducing our business case today, um, you can just familiar, familiarize yourself with Mural a little bit. Has everyone in here used Mural before or have most people, is this a new tool for most people? No? I will, I will use the icon to give you a thumbs up that I have used Mural. I don't know if you can see that. Let's... Oh yeah, I can see those icons now. Cool. Okay. okay. Well, it looks like most people haven't. Um, it is a great tool for like virtual whiteboarding if your team needs to do any of that throughout the hack hackathon. Um, so yeah, familiar familiarize yourself with um, creating post-it notes, um, write your name down the bottom and chuck in an icon um, and maybe tell us a little bit about what your favorite food is. Um, so Kurt, should I get stuck into introducing the business case just while everyone's um, familiarizing themselves with Mural? No, right. let's let's uh, let's let's appreciate here just for a moment uh, what people's favorite foods are, because I think it's breakfast where you are. Yeah. And I'm not sure what I'm going to fix for dinner yet, so I'm thinking Ryan might have a good idea here as he's putting it down. So Ryan, you're you're setting uh, you're setting my dinner plate. Uh, what am I gonna have? It's suspense. It's killing me. <laughs> Catherine's going with a little Vietnamese pho. 
Yeah. Emily, since we're all curious about sushi, what, uh, do you have a favorite piece or does, is it um, all? I'm not really, to be honest, just your standard salmon avocado, I guess, would be my go-to. <laughs> and I do appreciate the, the folks that are watching this on replay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're thinking about dinner. We understand. Uh, this is as well. For, for, for those who are, um, grabbing access to Mural is a great place for collaboration where you will have the opportunity to just kind of keep a good archive and let it morph and let it change and let it evolve and make it messy and move it around. And that's, it's just a very good collaboration tool. It's not an IBM tool. It's, it's one that we use as, as designers. And for, for the group here, now you can see you have skills and just slide it right into one of those resume line items that says mural. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's been a great one during COVID, um, that's for sure. Um, yes. Although I do miss the in-person whiteboarding sessions. Uh, Thank goodness the stickies, you don't have to rip off the pads and flick the back. Oh yeah, transferring board. stickies into digital PowerPoint is, yeah, yeah that's a job. <laughs> um, for people... Well, just joined if you chuck your email into the chat i can add you to the mural i think i saw someone just pop into the room and if i can let's look while while uh while that's happening the journey the journey that we're going to take today we will walk through a problem statement and and we've kind of preloaded the the, the problem statement just to set the frame then we'll move into, you know, the network that you would bring together to address that problem statement. We'll narrow it down and pick a use case. And then we'll move over into, think of the primary stakeholder and we'll develop an empathy map as the cornerstone and then move into the storyboard. That is a lot to do in one full day with a client and we're going to try and get you out of here by five o'clock central time for, for the folks that are here. So it is going to be compressed. Uh, you are going to, to be actively engaged uh, as, as we go through this. So keep those pens ready, keep the mind present. And Emily, if you're good, you want to take us away from what the problem statement is? Yeah, fantastic. So we've put together a bit of a problem statement just to showcase what we think would be a good way to run through approaching a problem. Um, and this might be something that your teams want to do um, yourselves. So we've just used the really standard um, ID and approach. We've got the link there if you want to um, follow that and maybe run your team through doing these how might we statements as well. So our little use case is the company um, EGI is launching their new sustainable store. Um, they have a really wide range of hats from fedoras to beanies, all 100% sustainably produced and supplied, which is obviously great to hear. We love having sustainable hats. So um, what we want to do is we want to think how we can um, protect this unique selling proposition and support business partners as they go um, as they go eco. So the problem statement that we've formulated for today is how might we empower EGI ecosystem members to differentiate themselves in the market with their eco-friendly processes and or products? So without further ado, I'll let Kurt run us through the marketplace diagram. Um, was there any questions or queries about the problem statement before we do move on? Just, just processing in, we're launching a new sustainable hat store, 100% sustainably produced and supplied, how do they protect it? How do they know? And how might we empower EJY ecosystem members 
in the network to differentiate themselves to realize more profits or to be able to give back to the planet as well. Okay. All right. And I don't know if we had anybody else join us. Maybe FS. FS, we have put emails in to the chat so that you can join us over on the mural. Uh, and I did add Matthew and Adrian as, as well. Perfect. So in, in, in the journey, in the journey where we've defined our problem statement, we're now going to pull back and start to think about who, who's going to be a participant in our network. So think about the fact that EGI is, is launching their product and they want the supply chain there. So if you take a look inside of the stakeholder map to the left, and then since we're sharing the screen, look at what you see now. And I can think of two, maybe three more participants, maybe five, maybe 10 that you would also add. So the same way that you got comfortable with adding your sticky for your favorite food, go ahead and add who else you think might be a stakeholder. Reviewing what we have, we have a, the EGI CEO. We may have our farm workers, maybe producing sustainable cotton. We may have the C-suite of the various works. We have truck drivers who are getting the product at different stages of the supply chain in. There may be government bodies, regulatory, that are looking at imp I mean, what about the tariffs? What about the taxes? Government bodies that are that you've registered and maybe you're not supposed to be uh, producing cotton or you has to be of a certain grade is what you have license for or um, making sure that that all labor laws are being applied. You have the EGI employees, you have the share owner, the stakeholders, share owners, the customers, we have the warriors. What's an eco warrior? I have a visual in my head. What's that eco warrior look like? Who else? Who else are you thinking? Go for it. I think I see somebody hovering right over it. I can think of one. What about shipping companies? Does so anyone maybe our carriers? Them? Yeah. Our international carriers? Jack Taylor, thank you for adding. Uh, we're, we'll get you populated into uh, Mural. So three PLs, the outstanding ad. Um, when we're thinking about blockchain, we're often thinking about the transfer of three things. So I think this may be the first time we've said blockchain already. Uh, three things that we're, that we're looking at, quite often is the transfer of money it's the transfer of information and the natural one that we started with is the transfer of assets. So who else could we add around the, the, the money piece? I think we've done a nice job with information, government bodies receive information. What type of mm, stakeholder would care about the money? Just grab a sticky, populate it in. Are you thinking like banks, Kurt, or? Thinking banks, I'm thinking what if we had fire in the factory? Yeah, uh, a, so investment, uh, investment, uh, not investment, insurance, insurance, insurance. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Another one that I'll, I'll go is, and I'll go down the information track, is will EGI apply and receive certification? Are there certification bodies? Uh, in, in coffee, we have a whole host, fair trade, green, right? There's a number of, uh, of certifications. Will you apply for certification? Maybe 
Maybe Jai is going to sell something that does come from uh, what is perceived as the waste of the coffee plant. Could you receive a premium for reusing that? So we have banks, we have lenders. Okay. So now with those stakeholders, we can slide these stakeholders. Great job, right? And there, and now we kind of, I like to use the the knights of the the round table, and and the knights here now are sitting at the table and they're going to interact based on the use case. So feeding you just a little bit, we've taken all the stakeholders, we've put them down, now we're putting them in the circle so that we are able to see each other, to think about each other, what their common interests are. And sometimes there's not. Um, sometimes it's it, there may be a participant in a blockchain network that really doesn't receive anything. Uh, let me pick on one of the producers. So if you are out in the field and you're just providing your asset and your information, you you may you, you may be looking for what does that get me? So the individuals who are asking you to be a part of and write your information to the network need to think about what the incentive is for you. Um, and one of the ways that that's unveiled itself is giving access and providing your digital identity out to the end consumer. So that's another way that we've been able to, to, to layer those together. And I like what you're doing here already. Emily is, is appreciating the fact that we've called out these stakeholders. You can start to put them together. Um, you, as you've learned today, you, you've thought of the concept of nodes. You could say that the individuals who are on the circle may have a node, and then you may have others joining that, that same node. You may share a node. So that's one way to, to start to think about it is not everybody has to have their own node that can be expensive. In this situation, we're looking at a private network, um, a permission network. Let me use the better term there. It's permission. You have permission to join, everybody knows each other so that means that everything's happening your your consensus is going to come together you're going to probably want to run to run this on a private permission network so with that then as our stakeholders um get pause what questions are coming up before we go to to use cases Leaning into to Wilson, Lily, Ryan, we're so glad you're here. Matthew, Jack, Patrick. What's are these coming together? Is it making sense where we are right now in the evolution of what you'll be doing for your hackathon? Question I see there is what's the right time to consider governance? Great question in Wilson, was that a yes back to, to Duffy's? Hey, Patrick. Or Wilson, what was that yes to? Um, let's let's go ahead and address Patrick's question. Let's see, Wilson, back to when you ask for your understanding. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, moving moving quickly. Um, let's add, let's address Matthew's first and get to Patrick's. Pat, uh, Matthew asks, where would the insurance agents go? Emily, as you were mapping on the on the wheel, where were you thinking insurance agents go? Yeah, so I thought that would be like a completely new org on the uh, on the ecosystem um, because yeah, they have all their own. Um, what's the right word for this, um, goals and their own needs as well. Um, and insurance agents, of course, can be made up of several different companies as well. Um, so when we're doing this, we're really look, looking at um, like groups, co like 
common groups of organizations that yeah have a common goal for example when we put down logistics companies of course it could be like a group of companies but they all have the same function does that answer your question who asked that is it Wilson? Matthew and he's saying that's what I was leaning towards it seemed or so Matthew. different from the others and that's a great call you could have a second ring right your your first when what you were doing especially in the hackathons we're thinking about what the minimum viable product is that you're trying to deliver in this situation for the problem statement we're not really addressing the insurance opportunity to so probably not one of the immediate people that we put in a primary seat unless our use case changes and that's what we'd, we'd move to next the other the other part is the right time to consider governance and patrick i'm going to lean in because i think you also have a uh, and ask you to lean in. I think you have a have a hunch. You want to give voice to your hunch for when the right time to consider governance is. We'd love to invite you in and come off mute. Hey, can you hear me? Gotcha. Hey, I didn't know if, whether it'd be easier just to do it on video versus um, type. So, hey, hey, Kurt. Hi, Emily. Thanks so much for for doing this. I think it's been really fantastic seeing the different presentations today. Um, yes, this was kind of a planted question, Kurt, as you alluded to. Um, you know, I really think that governance is one of the first things to consider when you're trying to think through the stakeholder ecosystem that you're actually building out. Because very quickly, once you open Pandora's box and you allow for systems to execute on, on rules, you know, you, the governance is going to be executed as well. And so making sure that people have a clear understanding of what their role is within that ecosystem, who's in control of it, where data residency exists, um, and also where transaction fees exist in terms of not only the processing of, of the, the quorum making, um, but also in terms of actually maintaining the network and potentially even upgrading it over time. Um, and the human capital involved in making sure that you're running a, a secure and, and optimal product. I think it really becomes something that needs to be discussed up, up front if you're going to be very serious about setting up a network that's got some uh, lifetime outside of a pilot or a proof of concept. Yeah, definitely. That's a great answer. <laughs> and, and because it's, it, it's such a great link with uh, EGI as a company for sustainable products, this is also about having a sustainable uh, organization and when we set this up by understanding what the monetization starts to look like what the onboarding what is what are the transactions that we're wanting to post what's the infrastructure cost how do we share that what happens if people want to leave you often get so caught up in the just let's go bill that we do forget some of those early questions. And that's what we're, that's, you're calling it out because it is, it's governance kind of starts as your, as your start. Yeah, I, th I think that's what's so exciting. Um, and just, this was like something that kind of came up in, in my thinking earlier this week. And I was actually reading through the case study that um, Professor Lassity and Professor Von Hook Grimko, um, the supply chain professor had put out that was looking at the DLT solution for Walmart's over the road network um, and the successes in mitigating the back office processes that you know, are unnecessary if you take a macro look at that enterprise and its stakeholders. If you can maximize the capital that you have to put together, you, you can go out and execute against those ESG goals, for example, and differentiate yourself from other market competitors when you're trying to service a more intelligent consumer that's demanding that type of visibility that again you can and automate that reporting process in an audit proof or an audible way and i think that's you know it drives these new types of value creation that you yeah. just don't otherwise see and so the the realization after i was reading that was that i think that we're we're approaching and i think that we'll approach within kind of the trajectory of of my time working 
towards something like no code business model development, where if you can execute with rules and governance up front with a technology infrastructure that's transparent and you can figure out how to model out those financial implications of an operation, you can start building modularly with service providers in a way to create some really interesting business outcomes without that, that margin creep of trying to service those different services with your own expertise internally. So that was my that was my takeaway in terms of why governance is important up front. And I'm gonna be quiet now. Yeah, that's uh, so glad you're here. That's a yeah. great take. Um yeah, it really does avoid, like you're saying, avoid like sticky situations going going further on, like something really unique that we've seen is you know, you do often have direct competitors working in the same room. Like for example, here in Australia, we have Project Ligon, which was um, four of the big banks working together to put together a platform for bank guarantees. And as a process of putting together these networks, you're exactly right. Um, like we're creating new value and um, yeah, new, new, new data that like people can actually look at um, and use and yeah, it's a it's a really awesome thing that's happening. Um, but I'll pass it back to Kurt because I think you're going to run us through the different use cases, right? Use Unless, cases. I don't think we yeah, have any more questions. And I, and, oh, go ahead. Um, I think I think we're good on questions. No. Nope. Um, and then just for for the individuals watching this in replay, uh, by intro, Patrick Duffy has been the president of. Blockchain and Transparent Supply, or BIDA, uh, which is right there in the core of moving goods uh, around the world, defining standards, and and really embracing the the, the blockchain. So, such an honor that uh, that you're here, Patrick. So thank you. Uh, shifting that and shifting to what is the use case that we want to work on, and this together as a group, uh, take a look if we can slide it just a little bit, Emily the potential use cases, let the individuals who are on the, who are on the phone, on the phone, umbrella, uh, take a look at these use cases. And it'd be great if you could add a sticky dot to different colored dot to what, what one really resonates with you. What do you think the problem is that, that boils down to what use case do we want to solve? And this is a cornerstone, uh, because this is what we then use for our empathy map. And then it becomes about, it weaves itself into the storyboard. So we have the bigger problem about producing sustainable products. But in that, what's the use case we really want to work into? Do you want to shape that a little bit more, Emily, from your perspective from use case? Kurt, I have a question real quick. How do we yeah. add sticky dots? All right, you can just Double click on an open space. Oh, hey, maybe I'll start boom. a voting session actually, Kurt. How about that? Oh. You want to number these then? And I'll give everyone three. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Cool. So if you click on a sticky note, that will let you vote. And let's see. Yeah, and so what Kurt will do in a second is um, with the chosen use cases, the top ones, um, show how each of the players in that use case are connecting and sharing information. Mm -hmm. And then that will give us a bit of a clue as to which use case is probably the best for to start off with for to build a business network, yeah. I'm just seeing, so we've got a few people who are still voting. I'll give it a So it is literally there. as simple as you just hover over the sticky, click, click, and you're there. Or click once, yeah, depending on which one you want. I guess you could vote three times for the same one. Yeah. It's your currency. And I was going to make a crypto joke. But <laughs> everybody else everybody else did in their head <laughs> uh, 
How are we looking? Do we see, are we seeing results? Because on, on our screen, and we're not. Yeah, I might go ahead see. and end the session. Um, maybe just shout Three. if Three. before. Yeah, anybody not voting that but still wants to. All right, let me go ahead and do that. Okay, so attach sustainability certificates to products is, yeah, top one. Then we've got four for show the provenance of cotton. And then we've got proof that a person is an EGI worker. All right, cool. So in each of these, exactly now, now Emily's taking us back over to the, uh, to the mural. And since you're driving the screen show, um, I think, I think you, you'll, you'll do the connecting with the arrows and the lines. But what I want to do is just think about, let's go around the circle, right? We have, I'm going to start up top with, with other eco retail stores. Are we worried about whether or not they're going to attach sustainable certificates to the product Do they need to be involved in the conversation? Probably not. In fact, we're going to want to differentiate against them. Are they, do the shareholders, um, are they going to have an active stake in the use case of sustainable certificates? They're going to care, but probably are not actively involved in passing information. The distribution companies moving the products to the location, they may use that information to show that they are moving sustainable products. So yes, we're going to link them to the hat store, to EGI's hat store. The farmer um, is, is at the source down below, absolutely cares about um, being identified. So we want to link the farmer in the store, the farmer probably to the distribution company, and the probably to the manufacturer. So we start to tie that regulatory body. So to the point that the regulatory body may be the cert certification body, uh, we can absolutely include them. Insurance agents, no. Materials companies, uh, maybe we're tying the materials to, to the farmer, right? And the manufacturer. Lenders, we're not gonna we're not gonna include them. The end consumer, absolutely, is going to be wanting to know. I mean, we're gonna want to learn from that end consumer, that information. Uh, logistics companies, maybe I'm lumping into distribution companies uh, as well. It, you know, it's, it's what one of the one of the pieces that we're not doing here is laying out a process map. So. Pro tip, um, what you would be doing is, is you would want to lay out your current as is process to identify each of the participants, what they're doing today, understanding their interests. And that would iron out is a little logistics company, is a distribution company, it's a regulatory body, is a certificate body. Um, we're wanting to give you this, hey, where are we connecting for information? Who, who cares? And then from here, you're gonna we're gonna go to the empty map before we go into the exact data identification, which we won't be doing today as well. So, Kurt, I'm gonna. Um, how are you feeling, Emily? Yeah. Go I'm ahead. gonna challenge your thinking here and say, do we really think that logistics company and the distribution company need to share certification sustainability? Great, great. The the one situation that they would is if they are if they are holding themselves out as a sustainable carrier mm. that is moving sustainable products. So if they're in their own niche, yes, you'd want to qualify. Where we're going, I like where you're asking is, do we need them in the MVP to really test this out? We can use any distribution company and they don't need to know that it's a sustainable product. Great point. So as, as, as much as we want to add, we also want to take away so that we can really give more focus I call that a positive no. We can get more focus. Is that where you're headed, Emily? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. It's a great area to go ahead and then take the line off. Um, other thoughts that are in chat. I'm not looking in. I'm going to flip over to chat. Oh, 
or Adrian, if you wanted to come up, or and Taylor on early. There's something that uh, that that's that you want clarification on. Pop them out. Okay. All right. So let's try and decide. Move this to the next level, and the handoff from your network and your use case is then who's really the primary stakeholder we're going to want to address. Who is it here? Is it EJ? EJ's uh, hat store? Is it? Is it the consumer? Is it the farmer? Let's go back to what we picked as our use case. Attaching sustainable certificates to products. So where will that happen? Do we want to build a solution as a certificate provider? Do we want to build a solution as EJ hat store? Where are you leaning, Emily? Um, so I'm just looking at like where the most connections are and it really mm -hmm. does look like it's farmers and the EJ hat store. Um, so yeah, I'm leaning towards the fact that, yeah, EJ would help provide that certification, um, and definitely farmers would be like a key part of that network, um, as they seem to have definitely have, yeah, a flow on effect in terms of that certification. Um, so we could put the farmer in, 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 where, in why we're trying to select the, 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 when we go in empathy maps, you'll do multiple empathy maps for the key, key users. What if we go for this one and we play the role of the farmer? Mm -hmm. You want to want to do that and, and, and what I like, especially about using the farmer is that's where we're, we're now at the source, the source of the data, source of where the certification, uh, the first certification will happen. Uh, and often the last for, as we talked about money, assets and information, they're kind of last in line for money. So if you're comfortable with it, you want to run with uh, farmers? Yeah. Did zero. we want to map any of the other use cases before we move on, Kurt? Or are you happy with just the just doing sustainability sets? Um, I'll ask the team. The, 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 the team that's on. Sorry if you're watching this in uh, live. You don't have a vote here. The team that's on, uh, did you want to map another use case? I'm going to look into the chat for that or a thumbs up. For... Maybe let's do EGI do... workers just to show like, like proving that someone's an EGI worker just to show yeah. like perhaps another use case. And I have a feeling that this one will have less connections um, just to show okay. how we go through kind of deciding like which use case will have a solid business network. Great. Uh, do you want to go as you're building the dot, the connection you want to run? Yeah, sure. And while, while you're thinking through that, uh, we just had a question here. Is it helpful or monetarily valuable to the farm or community since it's certification is at origin? And I'll share a personal, personal story uh, there where I'm working with uh, farmers in Honduras where when they can provide a higher quality product with more with valid certification, they will receive a premium at the next buyer down the line. So it is absolutely an advantage to have the cert certification. And you're talking almost 20%, 10 to 20% bump because you have the certification, as well as as you're working cert towards certification, 
your quality is usually increasing and the volume is probably likely increasing. So yes, and I would say in this situation is absolutely as helpful uh, that the certification helps you set a bar. So there you go, give you a little buffer in there, Emily. Cool. You ready for, uh, I think the, the use case you're going for right now is? Yeah, yeah, so that one is, this one was proving that a person is an EGI worker and I threw this one in as a bit of a dummy one um, just to show people like how you could use this mapping to show like where a business network might not stand up because if you think about it like who in this circle really cares about knowing to a certainty that someone is an EGI worker the only people who I could really think of was maybe insurance agents but I think a better question would be probably be more around like who cares to like a certainty that the product is an EGI product rather than is the person do we know that that person works at EGI The other that's that that's showing up is you know, just the ESG and the in the, the labor workforce, mm. right? That's another one that's. Um, I, I I know I know of uh, containers that are being burned of product right now because they are coming from cities where the labor laws are uh, not at the humane level that we expect uh, global trade to happen. So unless you have proof of origin that a product is not coming from said area, those containers are literally being burned. So that whole idea for labor and worker, if EGI has been hitting the, the right labor laws, how do we give visibility to that? And that would be regulatory bodies and more because insurance companies are also betting and the banks and the end consumer. Mm. There's a number of areas where that could go. Yeah, so that's a great example of how you could like expand that use case to make like a more solid business network in terms of um, actually expanding it to certifying that, um, you know, like farmers, yeah, certifying farmers as like uh, that they're actually the ones creating the products. Um, so like expanding that out rather than just, you know, like an EGI store employee um, to give like real value to that business case. Does that make sense to everyone? Thumbs down, thumbs up, thumbs up. Cool. And for the, for the folks who aren't home, we're having a great discussion as well about uh, sushi and whether or not you should have you would want to know the provenance of your sushi and would you be willing to pay more yeah so that you have your own use case from the use cases happening the discussion also happening in chat so inspiration beyond just uh what we're showing here fantastic job thanks everyone. cool so let's go ahead and do sustainability sets um so I think we were going to go with farmers, right, Kurt? Yeah. So we'll go with the farmer. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a bit of an empathy map. Um, so thumbs up for anyone who's done an empathy map before. No thumbs up? Oh, one thumbs up? Cool. cool. So Andrew. I'll just run everyone at, through at a high level um, how we go about this. So I'll go ahead and put um let's just say kurt the farmer <laughs> farm worker cool so what we want to do is we really want to think around okay kurt farm worker what are some things that kurt's saying thinking feeling doing when um he's creating uh or producing let's say cotton for these hats that we're going to make. Um, so what I'll get everyone to do is just paste sticky notes in the different quadrants. Um, and 
yeah, just whatever comes to mind first. Um, and then we'll take a look and see where some pain points are. Um, what we really want to do with this empathy map is um, build out where we're seeing like issues for real people inside this network. Does that make sense to everyone? I think, can everyone still hear me? I think I've lost Kurt. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, it looks like Kurt may have frozen. <laughs> yeah, okay, I wasn't sure if that was on my end or on Kurt's end. Nope. My internet is terrible, so <laughs> I was thinking it could be me. Um, all right, cool. So if everyone wants to get started with um, just pasting in some sticky notes, um, an example for Kurt, just to get everyone started um, in the doing, um, maybe, yeah, I mean, a really simple one, um, like recording how much cotton they've, um, they've, you know, loaded for the day. Any thoughts on the line in terms of like what Kurt might be feeling? Maybe he's feeling a bit ripped off by like large corporations, frustrated maybe. Yeah, great. Will this really help me earn more? Yeah, maybe he's saying something along the lines of surely there's, or yeah, that's actually a good place for me to point out. This is where we see um, people struggle sometimes, like the difference between thinking and saying. So thinking really is like those internalized thoughts that maybe like a user might not feel comfortable voicing. For example, like Kurt might be thinking, surely there's a better way for, for me to get paid for the work that I'm doing. He might not like voice that to his employer, but it might be certainly something that he's thinking. Um, whereas saying is definitely like an externalized, an externalized thing. For example, he's saying, uh, maybe he's saying like, um, yeah, how much, how much do you want me to, how long do you want me to work today, for example? Kurt, I think you're back. I think we lost you for a second there. Have we got you back? Yes. Yes. Audible? Do you have audible? Awesome. Yeah, and I, I see a bunch of arrows moving across the uh, across the uh, mural here. So I'm over on the mural, also helping populate. And what I what I really like about the, the mural is it just helps without knowing you're helping create your story, and you're creating a story not from your view, but from the person in in the center. Uh, ideal, ideally, when we come together as in, in a larger workshop, we have representatives from each of the areas that are connected on this use case. And you'd like to build a, a an empathy map to understand what they think, do, feel, and say so that you're out of your norm, normal comfort zone and you're 
feeling what they're feeling. You're thinking about their incentives. That just gets you all to yes and the best possible outcome faster and in higher probability of delivering the right solution. Instead of throwing it up there and hoping that they will come, you really, really put yourself in the other person's shoes. Hmm. Yeah, this is a really great activity to do with your actual user. I mean, um, yeah, sometimes it's not perfect and we just have to go on like what we know, but I would highly, highly encourage all of you to go out and talk to your users, maybe even do this activity with them um, because yeah, golden rule of UX, you're not your user. So you should definitely, definitely, definitely try um, and talk to your, to your user. Yeah. I will use the Wyoming Hackathon uh, three years ago as an example. A team that uh, this was was only a 40, 72 hour hack. No, it was 48. And probably up until hour 24, they were really spinning on their, on their use case. And they thought that they had it defined well enough. So at six o'clock, and of course it's due the next day by six, um, six o'clock that night, they went out and talked to almost 30, 40 different people to get this perspective. And that elevated their entire pitch to then they ended up uh, oh, 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 you know receiving an award in that situation for one of the categories but it was truly because they left the hackathon went out to stores and talked to uh, uh, consumers so it's it, it's one that I can't underscore enough that we do not go out and talk to the, the users and empathize with them enough Looks like the chatter on the uh, on the empty board is slowing. Is that right? Yeah, I think okay. that yeah, everyone's posted a few thoughts. So what I might do is just go around and do a quick playback to everyone of like what's been recorded here. Um, so Kurt, so Kurt's saying, how long do I need to work today? How will this affect um, my day? Uh, my day to day work? Um, I spend a lot of time producing a certifiable product. Yes. Um, maybe they're thinking like, what, what are the risks associated? Um, hoping you can pay his bills. Yeah. So I would say maybe this like kind of lies more into like the feels bracket. Um, but yes, certainly is thinking, yeah, maybe having thoughts around, um, how much more work do I need to do to be able to pay this bill? Um, uh, will this really help me earn more? And then deciding between sustainable and cheaper farming methods. So yeah, that evaluation process. Um, yeah, so a lot of like feeling here around, um, yeah, frustration about not being compensated. Like this is all kind of like monetarily attached, right? Um, which is interesting to see. Um, so what are they doing? Tending crops, prepping finished crops with transport, re researching new farming methods. So normally what we do here is like when we do this with the users, I realize today it's probably pretty tricky because I'm not sure how many of us are actually farmers here. <laughs> um, but normally we'd have a whole bunch of sticky notes and we'd start clustering and start seeing where the pain is. And what happens there is that that seeing that pain helps us to go, eventually go into solutioning mode um, and really create something that is addressing those pain points. And because of that, it means that our users will be a lot more engaged and they'll want to use the product, right? Because it is actually solving for a problem that they have. Does that make sense to everyone? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Kurt, anything to add? I just added, because thinking about where we're going is also reminding ourselves that, you know, this is about attaching sustainable cert certificates to the products. That's going to help us more probably, <clears throat> probably as we move to storyboard. Mm. And realizing again, 
each of this, these steps take considerable more time, but you can also see how quickly you can move through this, um, each of these steps. So when we're thinking about, do, should I invest an hour or two in mapping out my stakeholders and my empathy and developing storyboard early? Yes. So you had opened it up and I, I did not look over in, uh, in chat for questions. Here you got four thumbs up is what you received. Cool. Okay. Okay, so any questions about the empathy maps before we do move on to the storyboarding? I wouldn't mind, Andrew, you, you called out that you had done some empathy maps. Um, do you have some individual learning you want to share? If you want to come off mute, feel free. Um, like individual learning as far as just like completing them, like overall thoughts, kind of like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, when we, when I did it, um, it was really kind of part of the design thinking process. So um, kind of at the beginning of that. And I mean, like the major takeaway is really making sure you get to the root of the problem. Because I mean, sure, you, you could be fixing a problem. Um, but in reality, you're kind of just putting a band aid over the problem. And eventually, like, the band is going to bleed through and the problem is going to still be there. So it's, it's making sure you fully understand the situation and the people it's impacting and kind of the overall scope and scale of the problem and making sure you're actually tackling the problem at the root. Um, and then you'll, you know, inevitably have a more sustainable and more impactful solution going forward. Yeah, that's a great answer. That is, and, and is there, to, how would you apply it to what's on this empathy board so far? I, now I'm really putting you on the <laughs> hot seat. Don't, don't, don't feel pressured, but is there, applying that thinking, is there something that really stands out on this board that says, hey, we really, really need to be tackling this? Um, like from my perspective, like thinking of like a farmer, like, for all the work farmers do, like, in my opinion, I don't think they get compensated fairly, especially when it's, you know, products coming from different countries. And so, like, one is just, like, will this really help me earn more? And then um, I think I saw another one that was, like, um, why do we need this solution, pretty much? Like, why should I change what I'm doing? And so it's, like, from that perspective, I guess you would have to both be able to empathize with the person there and like understand their situation, but also present them with some ideas and reasons that they should adopt this solution and how it's actually gonna help them. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, and my gut feel here is just looking from like what we've got. Um, maybe this is a pointer that, you know, we need to go back and actually look at our use case because um, this certification of sustainable products really going to address the pain that these farmers are feeling of not going, not being compensated for their work. Um, so these are all questions that you can ask as you're as you're going through that design thinking process and really under un, uncovering the uh, the pain for your different users. Um, thank you for sharing, Andrew. Kurt, I think you might be on mute if you're speaking. Yeah, it's all about the infinite loop, right? Where we're going to adjust. We're going to push ourselves out there that where Andrew just took us and say, hey, let's reevaluate where we were. So you're going to go forward, step, take a step back, and be even more, on more firm ground. That's fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. All right. So from here, you want to shift them to, 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 to storyboard? Yeah. And what I, given uh, the participants, this everybody gets to create their own, and then and, and, and we'll be able to uh, play back a couple of these. Uh, you want to set up how a storyboard's used, what the components of the storyboard usually are, 
how do you how do you move the team and why do a storyboard at the at the so early in the process? What do you think, Emily? Yeah, so normally I'm going to counter that and say normally we wouldn't do it this early in the process. Um, we'd spend like a lot of time actually like digging into that problem and like understanding all the pain and making sure we've got a great use case. Um, and we do like a little bit of like ideation. Um, but yeah, the storyboard, when you do come to it and you know you've got um, like a solid solution that addresses real pain, um, storyboards are really great to align your team on what the future vision is. Um, and it really brings it up a level, the solution up a level. So you're still focusing on the entire story and how people actually interact with each other in that story. Um, another thing that it's great for is it will, it's really great for developing your pitch. Um, story being the key word in what I just said there. Um, so being able to tell, tell, the, tell the judges um, a story around your use case and like how it's helping people and how all the different interactions in that ecosystem will work. Um, so there's a little example here on the side um, and you can really see that it is very much like a high level process of, um, of how Frank is stepping through this journey. Um, and yeah, it talks a little bit around how he uses the product, but also around um, like the, the relationships that he's forming um, and yeah, the end goal that he gets to. So what we're going to do in this activity is, and I know it's early days for our uh, sustainable certs, but what I'd really like us to have a go today at doing is completing like one of these storyboards. So just have a bit of a think to yourself, like in the future vision for EGI's sustainability cert platform, um, like what might that process look like? So how, how, how might that start off with? Maybe it's a customer goes in store and they scan the hat and they see, oh, wow, that's cool. Like, you know, all of these certifications um, are attached to this hat. Maybe you want to look at it from a different point of view. Maybe you want to look at it um, from the point of view of like an EGI customer who um, comes in and goes, okay, we want to use a new distribution um, or a new material supplier. How can I make sure that they are actually supplying, certified by this regulatory body to provide sustainable materials? Um, so you'll see in the mural board, everyone gets their own square with um, a few a few um, snapshots in there. And what you can do is use like the icons and I'm sharing my screen, aren't I? Yeah, perfect. So you can use the icons to kind of illustrate your story and then put a little descriptor underneath the box. Um, you can also drag and drop in images. Um, let me just, yeah, so you can literally, I'm just gonna demonstrate. You can literally just drag and drop it in and it'll come in. Um, so if you wanna get some images um, off somewhere and drop those in, that's possible too. Um, so if everyone wants to grab a board and then we'll give you some time to have a go at doing that. Um, Kurt, anything to add here? Uh, well, so a couple tips here. One would be it's often the pictures tell the best story. As you can see from the example on on top, the pictures um, really help you you connect, and they and they allow even more creativity to come in as you're sharing the story. Uh, often, what individuals will do is just kind of feel really comfortable with the narrative and and run across and put the six uh, narratives underneath each box. Uh, you know, so it's, it's what's comfortable for you. And also think about what type of story you're, you're, you're trying to write. Is it a tragedy? Is it a love story? Is it <laughs> a new, new, is it a stranger in a new land? Right? What's, what, what is the type of, of story that, 
that, that, that you're right, right built for that. And then for those who are watching this on, on video, right, just take a take a sheet of paper and literally put six stickies across. I was over to my side thinking I had some stickies right here. Don't just put six stickies and right underneath. That's what we do in uh, when we are in face-to-face -face workshops. We just literally sit down and we allow ourselves to be quiet and just let it let it happen. Here you got an additional narrative from all of us as, as we're trying to do it all in a, in a compressed time. Quan. So, um, I think, I think there's should be some... some action on the boards. Um, I think I saw some newcomers to the room. So if you did just join, if you pop your email into the chat, I can add you to the mural board. Um, you will have to set up an account if you don't have one already. Um, but yes, chuck your, chuck your email in and I can add you. Perfect. Thanks, Sam, Lauren. I feel like we need some um, background music, Kurt. <laughs> Normally we'd have like some music playing in the workshop True. while everyone's working, heads down. <laughs> True, and if we were playing the music in Australia, what, what music might be playing, Emily? What music might be playing? That's a great question. <laughs> I'm not sure. I feel like I need something like light and ambient and soothing. It's early in the morning here still, so... Still yet to have my coffee, but um, yeah, definitely something soothing to like slowly power up the brain. <laughs> what about maybe what about you, Kurt? <laughs> maybe maybe there there's a, a channel for that, uh, yeah. right? So a spot, what, what, what would the Spotify channel be? Uh, inspiration. It sounds like a little more a little more of the classical. Get the get the mind going. Yeah, or some like ocean sounds or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the other, the other piece that I miss is just you know, the, the the click of the click of the pen, the pop of the of the whiteboard cap, the squeak. Yeah, of, of the yeah, pen ambient on workshop. On the whiteboard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Ambient relaxation. There you go. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, Rufus is great as well. Yeah, good call. Yeah, definitely great workflow music. I have definitely pumped out a few, a few artifacts to some Rufus before. Okay, how are we going with the storyboarding? Got a few people filling out some ones here. I was working with a uh, with a, with a with a, a company that was wanting to demonstrate um, one of their products was um, was were bean products and your mind can go anywhere with, with, with where this with where this this goes uh, but what was so great was it truly was the happy ending right it was just everybody was buying more beans at the at the end uh, so that's where they started that was just very easy to say this is my end state this is where I want to the, the world to be uh, with, with a real happy icon and cans of beans. And then, you know, as you, as you worked back through it, you, you got started to say, where's the real work need to be done? Mm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and don't feel like you have to fill in like every single box as well. Um, you can like uh, do like um, four, four or five rather than the full six. Um, but yeah, just just do do the best with what you've got at the moment. <laughs> And then the other one I'll see is uh, there'll be somebody who was really biased in that use case stage and they, they were hooked. They just, they, they couldn't uh, let it go. And they included, they almost morphed this storyboard to that use case. Mm. Uh, and, and it ended up bringing a whole other element to what they ended up, uh, ended up doing. Uh, it was, we were looking at moving raw ingredients uh, in, a, in, a, in a more expeditious way. And somebody said, look, I, I just want to reduce costs. And you, you saw the nice blend because of the storyboards to move product more expeditiously that usually would drive up costs. But because you morphed the two together, we ended up reducing costs as well. Unexpected outcome um, based on the original use case and goal. But it's one where you go back, kind of that infinite loop, go back to your other artifacts and allow your, your, your mind to bring it forward. Mm. Yeah, it's a great artifact to have um, to refer back to, definitely. Um, and yeah, the other great thing about it is it is, yeah, lo-fi as well. So, you know, it's easy to iterate on, um, and yeah, keep improving as you discover more things about your users. And what made this about blockchain, right? This feels like it can be universal. What made this session about blockchain? Um, good question, Kat. Um, I think for me, what really, what really stands out is that, yeah, and makes it different is that marketplace diagram and really thinking through the use case um, and then empathizing with that user and yeah, going back, what we'd normally do is go back to that marketplace diagram um, and really think about like how you're standing up that network. For me anyway, that's like what design makes design for blockchain different is yeah, really trying to empathize as, with as many users in that network as possible and making sure that there is actually a business network that you can stand up there that benefits real people. Yeah. You inspired me thinking about the network diagram also, the marketplace diagram, allows an EGI to set sit next to a Walmart yeah. or sit next to a Gap is you're really thinking about all the participants there and you're decentralizing uh, just just visually, you know, just as allowing you to, to go out and kind of put everybody as equals as they approach the same problem. Yeah, exactly. And driving, yeah, driving change through through doing that. Um, and yeah, helping like a Walmart or another really big org um, come on board with a eco-friendly platform. I think, yeah, it's a really powerful thing or it could be a really powerful thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, driving that change. And that's where you do want the, the, the voice as EJ is coming sustain, you know, with sustainability. Um, the large companies just there in the, in the local area for Fayetteville, yeah. Bentonville area, uh, right? They, they're, they're, they're important. And there's something also about the, the niche companies that are doing something and want to do something that, that's unique that the large companies can, can learn from as well. So yeah, just, there's, there's so much in here that blockchain creates without calling out well, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, like we know the tech works. So yeah, once you bring it up, up a level, it really becomes exactly, Kurt, about 
um, those business interactions and like how you're driving change within an ecosystem. Yeah, it's a really cool, it's a really cool thing to be part of, like driving that change. Mm. And if we say enterprise blockchain is maybe five years old, let's think about where it's going to go. Yeah. Pretty exciting. And if we'll even call it blockchain. <laughs> Cool. So how's everyone going? Do we need more time? Thumbs up for more time. I think we have a couple good examples. More time? Cool. Yeah, we got Wilson and Ryan and Lily dove in as well. And this has been uh, fantastic. You want to you wanna have them uh, do a little storytelling with their storyboard? Yeah, any... any um... Anybody who wants to share, any volunteers, any volunteers as tribute. <laughs> I can talk through my example in the middle. Fantastic. Ryan, who do we who do we have on the Thanks, phone? Ryan. Sorry. This is Ryan Decker. Hi, Ryan. Do you want to share your story, your storyboard? Let me zoom sure. in. Do you want to... Thank you, everyone. And we're not seeing your screen right now. Which is fun. Sure. So I can I can walk through uh, my storyboard, which essentially was considering the um, customer and how they would make decisions between um, a product that does not have sustainability certifications from blockchain and one that does. Um, so I can think like from my perspective, if I see two comparable products, um, one that has sustainability certifications and the other that does not, I would assume that the one that does not would probably be cheaper, um, just because there may be less at least short term, there may be less work that goes into, um, you know, certifying that product. So I probably pay a premium for one that has the certification. Um, and then I think through how I would justify that in my mind. Um, and so I'd think back to going through if I if I could see the certification at every step of the way, um, I could see the farms that were used and I could see that those farms do not um, release pollution or uh, harmful chemicals into the environment. I could see once it moves to distribution and uh, production, I could see that these factories use clean energy uh, rather than ones that may um, use traditionally not uh, unclean energy that may be cheaper. Um, and then from that, I can see why I would pay a premium for um, this product. And I would realize that this is a short-term premium while allowing for future benefits, because if a company is sustainable, um, that word in and of itself means that that will sustain throughout the future. Um, so even as regulation comes through or things like that, uh, that wouldn't be drive. That's more expensive. And then from that, I may make a decision to purchase that product, which both increases returns for the company, um, as well as, you know, makes me feel good about buying a product that is sustainable and does not have a net negative impact on the environment. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Ryan. That was great. Um, yeah, I really liked at the end there how you're saying, yeah, the customer feels great, you know, about buying this product. Um, and it can you can definitely see how like change is starting to be like driven by by this platform. How did you how did you find this process? What was your takeaway from um, creating the storyboard. Do you think this is something that you might use in your groups or yeah, what did you find interesting about going through this process? Sure, I think it's very valuable to consider who the stakeholders are in the process, right? So to me, obviously with companies that sell products, um, their primary stakeholder is the customer for a lot of, um, for a lot of companies. And so making sure that you think through from each perspective as to like what is benefiting the customer um, and how they would make their decisions is always um, really important. And I think that would carry over into the different use cases. Obviously, they're not all related to a business selling a product. Um, so there may not be a customer that purchases a product, but they're still a user or a consumer of the, um, of the product or of the service or whatever it ends up being. So understanding how they make decisions helps you kind of back into how the company should make decisions to um, 
facilitate the proper result that you would want to expect. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, and you did a great job at telling the story there. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Kurt, anything to add? Yeah, a few things I really liked as well. The beginning, the middle, and the end, right? You could feel that natural arc. And in that arc, I felt the cumulative uh, sustainability develop, not just from the farm, which is where we started, but how you also incorporated the sustainable factory, right? To then show that it does pay because that visibility and transparency is present, which then closing, I'm looking at the, the PPP, the people, the planet, and the profits uh, that, I, that I think you just finished so high on. So been fantastic use case, and it dared to challenge just the view of the farmer and went beyond. Fantastic. Yeah, so I think you're sharing your screen now, Kurt, because I think at some point we ended up both sharing at the same time. So if you want to pan across, there we go. Wilson, would you like? Wilson, are you comfortable, though? Um, yeah, I'm comfortable. I don't know if I did this in the, exactly the right way. It seems like mine's a little bit different. I kind of took the more holistic kind of where the business was looking at how how so how the farmer would be like looking at where he's at, trying to kind of move forward. So I was saying like kind of an analogy to the mountain. Like now that we're at the base of the mountain, we're, we're year in. Like where are we now? And then going from there to pinpoint the kind of best course of action to just keep moving forward. Like, how do we continue to make sustainability a competitive advantage for us? And then just to always just start moving from there, keep those ideas in mind and start to like begin um, working on different like new forms of sustainability. How can we just keep moving this idea forward and working on how to implement them? And then going into just like avoiding any setbacks and kind of look at it, everything from a different perspective and just keep working towards that goal until you finally get to the completion, then recognize our gains. And then after that, back to the drawing board and start forming new ideas. And, and just such an appreciation here of kind of mapping that process of success in achieving our goal. You, you really took our goal and put it up and said, this is this is where we're going and you walked us through and, and kept us on on the path is what it felt like is that is that where you you intended us to, to get to 100 percent. so fantastic way to get us there and the opportunity is now as we're going what is it that we're that we're doing um not in just the active step but also as we're taking the, the sustainability component and now applying a user in there. And this could be the farmer and what the farmer wants to see happen. It could be the factory. It could be the customer. Just weaving now the characters in here to enhance what you're challenging the company to do. So absolutely great, great, great level. And you're so ready to go next level. You're, you're just, you'll take off from here. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to call out, like, this is what's great about, like, storyboards. You can use it for so much to, like, yeah, this is, a, like, in my, my mind, this would be, like, a great way to align your team as well on, like, the direction that you should be heading and just using it as a teaming tool as well. So it is so flexible, like there's no, like you were saying to start off with, you were gonna say, I'm not sure if I've used this in the right way, but the answer really is, is there's no kind of like right hard and fast way that you can use these tools. Like if it's gonna help align your team, then that's perfect. Like you can use it to do that. And um, yeah, there's no hard and fast right or wrong. Mm. Lily, you wanna lean in and go? We have one time for one more. Or Andrew, let's see. Andrew's got one up as well. Andrew, Lily, either of you total volunteer. If you want to lean in, go for it. I guess I could do mine. Yeah, um, it's not as visually appealing as the last, um, but pretty much 
so I looked at it kind of like Ryan from the end user perspective. So a customer would scan a product label and I've been seeing these pop up. They're like smart labels that will kind of show you where the product's from, give nutritional info, stuff like that. And so that would pretty much be powered by the blockchain after, you know, all the items have been, uh, you know, certified as, you know, fair trade, whatever certifications you want to put on there. And so a customer would be presented with a visual of the supply chain of the inputs, So they would see where all the different items came into, how it was assembled pretty much, like what sustainability practices were put into place for that. And the customer would be like, hey, this is a great pot product. You know, maybe some of the proceeds could go to a good cause. Um, and then, you know, the customer would be like, hey, this is awesome. I want to buy this product. And they just decide to buy the product based off that information. What? Oh, Molly and tomorrow also, for dinner at five. Was there someone sharing something there? a bit of background noise yeah i think they took it up okay yeah awesome thanks for sharing andrew um that's great what 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 were your thoughts on that process um i i kind of looked at it from my perspective like yeah kind of like what i would want to see um and then like i guess i'm also a supply chain major so like being able to incorporate the supply chain kind of in there um, would just kind of interest me. Um, so that's kind of how I went about this. Yeah, that's great. I want to ask Andrew, what, what do you think of the biggest challenge is in this, in this story? Where's the biggest challenge? Uh, in the store? Oh, in the story. Okay. Um, I mean, it would definitely be certifying. In story. In your story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah where's yeah. the biggest challenge? Yeah, it would be certifying, you know, produced correctly. Like, unless you have someone going out and certifying, like, in person that everything's being, you know, either organically grown or, you know, there's humane work practices. I mean, you know, companies lie all the time about their, you know, workforce and how stuff is actually produced. Um, so you would really need to have a, a system in place that, you know, doesn't cost too much because you would end up giving that cost to the customer, but it's also extremely effective in, you know, kind of almost like a proof of proof of war, proof of stake kind of deal um, where the customer is sure that everything is what it is. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good point to make. <laughs> it's a hard problem to solve. Very hard problem. And that's the cornerstone. That's where blockchain comes into this. It's about that trust that this is certified, that the processes are behind it. And one of the biggest challenges, other than the digitization of the information, is the reliable passing of accurate and timely information. Uh, having worked with with a large consumer products company for eight weeks seven weeks of those eight weeks were spent on providing clean trusted data and that was understood so it became a very much a data problem the blockchain and the certification became an easy part it really became about the their, their core legacy data. So you need that to then be able to be transparent and provide that trust that you that you so boldly highlighted. Uh, Emily, you know, I think we've, we've just heard three great storyboards. We've gone through empathy mapping. We've identified use cases. We've tied out the network. We started with a problem statement all for the sake of having the best possible hackathon. Uh, you want to open up for, for additional questions here? Do you want to close? Where do you want to go? Yeah. Um, yeah. Any questions from anyone on the call? Um, now's, now's your time. Hey, Kurt. 
I was wondering, what do you, th what is your perspective on where do you think, like, when do you think, or when, I guess, do you think that blockchain technologies will really, like, take over as, like, the forefront, like, the internet in the 90s? So, question as to when blockchain will be as prevalent as the internet. Uh, a lot of this is going to be based on adoption and readiness, and you considering this as an option. Uh, one of the challenges early on was, well, why not a database? Right? And I can do this via a centralized database. And as you start to peel back the, the, the layers, sometimes a database is the right solution. So to say that blockchain is going to pass every bit of information, unrealistic. I think it's blockchain is going to be part of the family of a solution with AI, with IoT, with databases that are coming together to help ecosystems. And I've heard that a few times today, help ecosystems advance and move to the next level. We've done a great job in the early 90s, moving to the 2000s of establishing digitization of processes with ERP solutions. Now we're talking about moving entire supply chains into a direction, entire industries that can share information. And when they're sharing this information, we're going to gain new insights that we've never had before. We have to be stewards of that information. We have to respect it, respect the privacy, and make sure, sure it's secure. I've gotten a little bit away from your asking of when are we going to be seeing it as pervasive as the internet? In some areas, you are, you are seeing it very much in, in already in, in food, in global trade. You're seeing it make its mark in currency and challenging old laws that are, are, are out there for what is banking, what is currency. So you're seeing a big shift. Uh, the world that we know it today is blockchain with some islands. We'll see it much more interconnected, but it's going to be purposeful with intent and it won't be a lot of the experiments that have happened. And that's what we're seeing within the IBM Corporation is the growth of these networks. They are scaling faster than ever and these are production networks. So that's, I'm not gonna say, you know, it's June 23rd, uh, 2023, uh, you know, because I don't think that there is a, an exact date. I think we're gonna see different maturity uh, a little bit global, but also in in uh, in industries. It's a long long answer. Did you have a follow up to that? Did something resonate there? I, I have a follow. -up. I'm sorry. I wanted to add on to that. Do you see that companies could use trigger events to try and move into that space? I mean, we saw the Texas Power Grid failure and. Yeah. Having reliable technology that could solve for a, a disaster would maybe be a quicker motive. So this is terrible, maybe not, but don't let a bad situation get in the way of a golden opportunity. And I do think that when we, with what we just did with the empathy map of what's happening today, we were to map the, the, the Texas power grid and what people were saying, doing, thinking, and feeling about the as is, and with the vision of, of potentially a new way, what they could do, think, feel, and say, and creating a new vision, and saying, how do we get there? There are opportunities within there for blockchain capabilities. Yes, vaccine distribution, we're learning about that, right, in ways that we never had. We have never accelerated a vaccine as fast as we just did. And there were, Companies around the globe working at, hey, we know that there's going to be one, but how are we going to distribute? How are we going to ensure that people are safe? Um, how are we going to allow people to go to a New York Rangers game? How do we know that our people can return to work safely? So in these moments, yes, pull up, pull up and, and challenge the way and use the trigger events as you, as you termed it as an opportunity to advance not just your cause, but because it's the right way to do things. Uh, 
that was an awesome answer, Kurt. <laughs> Um, as, you, as you guys are heading into your hackathon, fears, scare, concerns, excitement, oh my gosh, anything that, that you want to give voice to or ask about? Catherine, as we're at the end, would you mind just... Um, reminding them about maybe mentors or any other resources that they may have to to take this and and be the best that they can be absolutely um yeah just going forward if you have any questions um maybe about a user you know experience for a different use case or if you're trying to implement any type of blockchain products uh ibm offers or the IBM use case. We'd love for you to connect back with these two about technical questions um, and about, about kind of that empathy mapping or that storyboarding. Uh, it's applicable to so many different types of use cases. So if you have questions and want to meet with mentors on your weekly basis, please reach out to these two, um, as well as our other list. You can check them all out, Umbrella at their speaker uh, profile or contact them with their information there. But um, weekly, we're hoping you guys do check-ins and uh, just keep on top of, you know, whatever that might require with the feedback that you get. Um, but excellent job today. This was one of my favorite workshops. You guys did such a great job with engaging and um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks everyone for joining. Emily from halfway across the world. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you, Kat. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, I Yeah, feel free to, as Catherine was saying, reach out. Um, and good luck with the hackathon. Take care.